Hi, I'm Brian Hale, and I want to welcome you to another edition of A Better Life, brought to you by New Horizons Community Church. I'm so glad you're joining us today. Hey, if you have your Bible, grab it, and we're going to have a great time today as we learn another installment of What Would Jesus Undo? We'll see you on the other side of this service. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. It's going to be an awesome service, and it has nothing to do with me, but everything to do with him and how you react to him. Amen? Isn't that what you pray for? Hey, let the pastor be see-through, see the cross, receive the spirit. All that stuff can happen, but all it has to do with how you receive him, how you're open to him, and how you respond to him. Amen? So it's gorgeous outside. Some of you are thinking barbecue. Some are thinking the lake. Some are thinking a nap. Some are thinking lunch. Can we not think about all those things I just told you not to think about? Don't think of a blue hammer either. Isn't that the classic? Yeah. All right. So, this is going to be, hey, it's, listen, it's great to have all of you here today. Welcome to New Horizons, and I hope you came with your hearts prepared. I mean that. A lot of times we can come to church and we don't prepare our hearts. We prepare ourselves, we take a shower, or you should. You shave, or you put on nice clothes, you put on decent clothes, or clean clothes, right? Or clean clothes, clean is good enough, okay? Come prepared because I want you to understand, and I'm absolutely serious, that we're going somewhere today. And I'm not sure if your hearts are prepared. So I'm just going to tell them again. I'm going to tell your hearts, get prepared right now. Everyone kind of do this thing. Prepare your hearts. And I mean it. Prepare your hearts. So I'm going to tell them again, get ready. It's going to be an awesome, awesome morning. Awesome. We're going to go somewhere today, and I mean that. But before we go there and... I, I, want, I want to say that although our life groups have concluded for the summer, you know, you may want to get together and keep in touch with your life groups. That's great. Have a barbecue, have a Bible study, get together. In September, we're going to have a brand new kickoff for our life groups. And so uh, be prepared for that. In fact, I'm probably going to be looking for some new life group leaders because we'd like to expand our number of life groups. And I just want to say thank you to those of you who have been stepping into life groups because we believe, and I happen to know this for a fact, that we do life better together. We really do. Karen and I, we're part of a life group, and we've laughed together, we've cried together, we've prayed together, and it's just better together. It really is. And if you're not yet in part of this type of community, you're miss you may be, and it may be true that you're missing the one thing spiritually as we grow and sharpen one another together. Now, if you're new with us, we're in a, uh, a message series, and it's called, what? It's not called, what would Jesus do? It's called, what would Jesus undo? See, there's a lot of bracelets out there we've worn for years, but our message series is just this. What would Jesus undo? What are the things that break the heart of Jesus? What would he undo? So last week, uh, we talked about Jesus undoing spiritual indifference, and there was a huge response to that because people realized that in their own life, they're kind of, meh. Remember me saying that last week? Meh. I know it's a new word, and probably some of you older people haven't heard it. Have you been saying it all week long to your wife or your husband or something like that? Maybe not, but you can start. Anyway, so if you were here, I opened up the message about a story uh, of a gift that I gave to a person, and the person was indifferent towards the gift. They didn't even notice that I gave them a gift, and they just left it behind. So today I want to open up. Is my wife in here? Karen, are you in here? She's not. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I want to open the message with another one of my gift-giving mishaps. <laughs> So evidently, evidently, I understand. I have my weaknesses, my faults, and evidently I need to grow in the spiritual gift and style and heart behind giving gifts that really matter. Now, this was years ago, and our kids were young, and it was Christmas time, and I had to buy my wife a gift because I wanted to do that. Not that I had to, but I wanted to. Now, I have heard, now you tell me if this is true, I have heard that married couples, um, that as they continue to share years of wedded bliss they become one in their their thoughts their likes their dislikes their passions so well if you were to ask any of my children what is it i'm abnormally drawn to when shopping in a mall or at an outlet center or anywhere for that matter is a place 
I know it's strange. It's a place that sells kitchen gadgets. Oh, they're all pointing at Daddy White over there. He's the same way. I'll see you at next week's meeting. It'll be great. <laughs> kitchen gadgets, or the place that I would call the place that sells all the cool kitchen stuff. Right? You gotta have, you'll, you'll use it once, put it in a drawer, it'll take space, and you'll move it around, but you gotta have it. So I thought, okay, we've already been married for 10 or 12 years, and I'm thinking by now, she would have the same affinity for kitchen gadgets. So it only makes sense. Because that's what men do. We make sense. <laughs> that I, her loving husband, got her a food dehydrator for Christmas. After all, who doesn't love fresh-made jerky or banana chips or... That stuff is awesome. Come on, honey. Huh? Wait a minute. Come to think of it. That may not have been the year of the food dehydrator. That might have been the year of the amazing Jack LaLanne food juicer. The wonder juicers? Yeah. I mean, come on. Come on. What says I love you more than fresh carrot and cucumber and beet juice? Right? I'll tell you what an amazing wife I have, still have, <laughs> is that she has never complained once or acted disappointed in any way of, shall we say, my less than stellar gifts. Children, on the other hand, <laughs> by the end of January, they have told me what lame gifts I give. And they leave me with thinking, maybe, you know, maybe it would be best if I just wrap an empty box, you know, and, and hand her some cash and say, here, honey, whatever you pick out, that's exactly what I would have bought you if I wasn't such a lame husband. Right. Empty. Empty box. I don't like cash for presents. That tells me you didn't give much thought to it. And I was hearing a story about a man that, you know, you've all, you've all heard of the, 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 the small box, and then they wrap it in a bigger box, and a bigger box, and a bigger box, and a bigger box. Well, the man got so into the wrapping of the gift, he forgot to put the gift inside. And so what it was is it was like Disney tickets, and so he's going to take the family to Disney, so the little children were opening it up, and it, nothing. It's an empty box. It's an empty gift. Hey, speaking of empty gifts, let's just do this. Let's, speaking of empty gifts, what if the songs we sing, the sermons we preach, the acts of service that we do are often empty gifts to God. Now, this is where I need you to stay with me because this is going to start hitting home and I need your heart to get ready for a journey because that's what we're going to do. It'll be awesome. What if our lives are wrapped up on the spiritual image on the outside, but on the inside, because our hearts are far from God, we're actually offering God an empty gift? What would Jesus undo? Hmm? Jesus would, I would call undo hollow worship or empty worship or what Jesus calls worship in vain. Please take notes in your notes. You can write this down if you want. It helps you follow along. There's a pencil. There's a, a thing in there in your bulletin. Take notes. It helps you keep up. Also lets you go home and see if everything what I'm saying is biblical or not or if it's truth. You can turn it into a devotion at home. All kinds of fun stuff. And it may give some of you people an opportunity to write that haven't written all week. What turns the heart of God? What is it that upsets Jesus? And that is hollow worship. So I want to show you this in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 15, and we're going to begin in verse 1. And I'll try to show you a very interesting conversation between the Pharisees and between Jesus. Between the Pharisees and between Jesus. Scripture says this. Then some of the Pharisees, teachers of the law, came from uh, came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Why don't they wash their hands before they eat? Well, no. what we have to do here is we have to understand is what the Pharisees were so obsessed with something called ceremonial cleanliness. This has nothing to do with physical hygiene. It's not physical cleanliness. It, and it, and this is not the same type of obsession as keeping your body clean. They were obsessed with ceremonial cleanliness. Why? Because a devout Jew, as a devout Jew, they believed there were two categories for everything. 
It was either clean or unclean. Animals are clean. There are, there are clean animals. And there are unclean animals. There is a way to prepare food. Your food, uh, your food un- there's also uh, ways that are unclean. There are things to touch that are clean. There are things that are unclean. If you have any kind of bodily discharge, you're unclean. If you have a skin problem, you're unclean. If you touch a pig, you're unclean. If you touch a dead body, you're unclean. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem with, with, with when you were unclean. That uncleanliness, uncleanness, no, uncleanliness, uncleanliness, it was contagious. Did you know that? It was kind of like cooties. How many of you remember fifth grade? Hmm? Oh, girls, cooties. Something happened in eighth grade, though. (laughs) Cooties. It was transferable. If you got cooties, you give cooties. If you were unclean, you could transfer it. So let me, so if you, let's say, an unclean mouse touched a cup. The cup was unclean. If you touched the cup, you were unclean. If your spouse touched you, your spouse was unclean. Therefore, you were not fit. No one's fit there to worship. So what did you have to do? When you were unclean, you had to go through a, uh, like this elaborate ceremony to cleanse yourself spiritually so that you were eligible to worship God. And what you had to do, if you have to take a certain amount of water, which was known as a, I don't know how they measure it, but it's called a quarter of a log. That was the measurement, a quarter of a log. Now, it sounds like a lot, but it's not. If you want to know how much a quarter of a log is, you ask, a quarter of a log is enough water to fit in one and a half eggshells. That's a quarter of a log. All right? True story. I'm not making this up. All right? An eggshell and a half full of water. And you'd have to take your hands like this, all right? And someone would pour the water over your unclean hands, thus cleansing your hands. But when your hands touched your, your water, the, you know, the unclean hands, the water became unclean. Understand? So you had to clean your hands like this. So the unclean water, so the unclean water would drip to the ground and not make contact with any other part of your body and make it unclean. Because if it rolls down your arm, then your arm becomes unclean, and you're still ceremonially unclean. So then you had to do this with your hands, and then the water would fall again. And you'd rub your hands together, and you would be ceremonially clean. I've never had to experience this before until a few years ago I went to Israel, and I was clueless about this. I knew that there was ceremonial cleaning, but I didn't know about this until I came or experienced it until I came to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. And as I walk up to the entrance of it, they asked if I was a Jew or not. And I knew, I knew that whoever entered had to buy uh, a yarmulke, a skull cap there. So I had purchased one beforehand. And they wanted to know if I was a Jew or not. And I said, no. So uh, he wanted to make sure I had a yarmulke. And then he said, go wash. And I'm thinking, dude, I'm good. No, and I looked, and there were all these stations with running water, constant running water. There was no handle, nothing to turn on, and you would ceremoniously put your hands in there, and you'd be clean. Because if you didn't do it, you could not worship God. A devout Jew would only do this, you know, let's say they would do this before their meals. They would literally do this, not just before their meals, but a religious devout Jew. They'd do it between the courses of the meal. In other words, you would cleanse yourself before your hamburger. Then, again, you'd have to cleanse yourself before you ate your tater tots. All right? I haven't had tater tots in a long time. (laughs) Then you'd have to cleanse your hands again before you had the chocolate malt. And asking the Pharisees, they were asking Jesus, Jesus, why don't your boys do this? And then Jesus just unleashes on them. He says, you're not treating people with respect. You're not showing people love. You're not showing other people love. You're not showing love to other people. Your hearts aren't even concerned with God. And here you are obsessing with all these externals. When internally, you're so far from being right. 
This is what Jesus says in verse 7. He says, you hypocrites. And I don't know what Jesus is going to call you someday, but I think of all the things I'd ask him not to call me would be a hypocrite. And I don't think he calls anybody a hypocrite that doesn't deserve it. But he calls them a hypocrite, and then what he does is he does what we talked about last week, using the word, using the word, using the word. He quotes the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They give me lip service, but their hearts aren't right. Then Jesus says this. He says, how do they worship? Did you get that? How do they worship? In other words, you can worship and not have your hearts right. Ooh, really? Then Jesus says, they worship me in vain. Their worship isn't pleasing to me. On the outside, it looks like worship. But because the inside is not right, it's an empty gift. It's hollow worship. It's worship that doesn't touch my heart. It's worship that is in vain. So what would Jesus undo? He would undo the show on the outside, a hypocritical expression, a pretend faith. Hey, everybody, you know I'm kind of a Christian when inside your heart is very, 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 very far from truly worshiping God. Can I tell you, I've been there a lot in my life. And I'd like to say, as a church, we have a lot of potential to grow in our heartfelt expression of worship to God. In fact, just as your pastor, to me, this is one of the greatest areas of potential spiritual growth that we all of us have, every one of us, you, me, all of us together. And goodness gracious. And so I, I want to talk for a few minutes about worship because that seems to be a buzzword and everyone likes to talk or argue or complain about it. But let's just talk about worship for a minute. When we talk about worship, what most people immediately do is they start thinking about what? music they think not just of music they think of the style of music right they think they think uh, well i like this style of worship and i don't like that style of worship or they may think about the environment in other words perhaps well um maybe they worship to should be done in a in a very reverent and holy environment where someone else would be, no, 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 no. you got to understand about worship, I think. It needs to be rowdy. It needs to be fun because we serve a joyful God and, and we should express to him our love with great compassion. So which one's right? Huh? For example, for example, those of you may have worshipped elsewhere, maybe in, a, in what we would call a liturgical church during a funeral or a small country church setting. And so for some of you watching online, maybe overseas, where the style was very different. I know it was when we went to, um, when we went to Guatemala, uh, I was able to lead worship, and I got to see a little bit of what they had done in this particular church, and it was very, you know, the, the, the worship lead, the, the song leader. And then I got to lead, and I, I did what I do, all right? And the worship leader walked up to me afterwards, and he said, oh, I'd really like to do what you do. And I said, don't. Do what God calls you to do. Don't do what I do. Make sure you do what God calls you to do. It has nothing to do with me. But maybe, for some of us, we grew up in a traditional format. Or maybe in a charismatic format. And when I say charismatic, I don't mean speaking in tongues. I mean a, a format with a lot of charisma. So how many of you have ever been, let's, for example, been into a place of worship that was very different from the style of worship you saw today. Can I see some hands, anybody? Look around, look around. It's different, yeah. Some of you, including myself, we grew up with a very different style. And when you think about it, when you think with all the people all over the world, with the different races and the different life situations, um, the different styles, the different cultures of music, the creative ways to express worship to the goodness of our God, they're almost limitless all over the world, wouldn't you think? When I, when I was in Guatemala, you know, a couple of months ago, you know what was really cool? I was at this, this more progressive church. It was a Nazarene church, huge Nazarene church. And the, the praise team was up here singing. They had two different worship leaders at different times for different songs, two keyboardists. But they had eight ladies down front doing interpretive dance. And I thought that was really cool. And then someone blew a shofar. Do you know what a shofar is? It's a ram's horn that the Israelites would use to, to warn about kingdoms or to, to, to clear 
uh, times of praise. In the middle of it, now I have a shofar in my office. It's about this long. This guy had one of those big jobbies. And so just in the middle of songs, you know, you'd, you'd be singing and you'd be worshiping. And all of a sudden you're Bruh! out in the behind, behind you. And it's a guy blowing the shofar. And I thought, oh, that's so cool. Should we try it? It was so cool. So we can talk about liturgy. We can talk about a cappella. I love a cappella. We can talk about what's called high church. We can talk about charismatic church. We can talk about church of 15 minutes of worship. Or we can talk about some churches that worship for two to three hours. We have to acknowledge there's, there are limitless ways of expressing love and worship for God around the world. With so many different ways, which is the best? Huh? Which way is the best? Let's just take two examples, all right? Two examples. Let's take a very traditional church. Very traditional. Let's, and then let's take a very expressive, charismatic church. Which one is right before God? The answer is both are right before God and neither are right before God if the heart is not right. Amen? Okay. Going somewhere. That's what we're going to do today. Both. Or any expression of worship honors God when our heart is connected to who He is. But no form or no expression of worship is right when our heart isn't right. They honor me with their lips. That's what Jesus said. But their heart is far from me. They therefore worship me in vain. So what we have to understand is that true worship, in your notes, touches the heart of God, and it's not about the style of music, but it's a reflection of the condition of the heart. Amen? True worship that touches God is not a reflection of the style of the music, it's a reflection of the heart that's right before God. Think about this. Think about this. This would never happen, but... Let's say, now I have four, do four children, okay? I call them children, but they're all grown up right now, okay? So let's say they come to me on Father's Day, which is what, next week? Is that next week? Okay. What, if they come to me on Father's Day and they say, Dad, we prepared some songs of adoration and worship for you. Okay. Okay. So imagine them standing completely there still, and they sing a cappella singing a song to me from their hearts, and I go, no, 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 children, don't, no, you don't understand. That's not the style I prefer. When you tell me how great I am, and I am great, when you tell me how great I am, and how much you love me, I prefer a, a band with fog, you know, and lights, and one of you needs to wear really tight jeans and put your spiky stuff in your hair, and one of you needs to be the worship leader. If I don't see a worship leader, if I don't see, then it's not right. Never do that. Never do that. At the same time, imagine if they came to me banging pots and pans. Bang, 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 bang. Hey, Dad, you're the greatest. Bang, 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 bang. No, 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 no. You don't understand. Your father prefers a more austere, serene environment where you read from some liturgy first because liturgy is what turns my heart towards you. Express it in a way that brings me real honor. In other words, the way I prefer. You know what? <laughs> Listen, they can do whatever they want from the heart because true worship that pleases God isn't about the style of music. It's about the condition of the heart, right? So what would Jesus undo? He would undo hollow worship. So we have to understand that, and I... Mm, I hope you get this. Christianity is not a hobby for us. It's not an, an interest for us. It's not a label we wear. If we're a follower of Jesus, Christ is our life. Amen? You still with me back there? Amen. Therefore, worship isn't just songs we sing, but worship is the life we live. It's the life we live. In fact, if I could for a moment, hey, we're going to cut it short a little bit. Praise team, if you could come up here for a moment. Praise team, where are you? 
Come on up. Would you, would you guys mind? Just so we could get set for worship, I've been talking about it this morning. Praise team, come on up. It's okay. It's all good. And when you're ready, Dion, just go ahead and start playing whatever it was we uh, talked about you playing. And it'll be fun. What I want to do is I want to give you a moment just to prepare your hearts to think about who God is and visualize what he did for you. I told you we're going somewhere today. We are. Through his son, the sinless and perfect son of God, who was obedient even to death on the cross, who suffered, bled, and died for our sins to be forgiven. Jesus defeated death, hell, and the grave. He rose from the dead. He ascended to the right hand of the Father of God Almighty. And at this moment, right now, He makes intercession for you. What does that mean? In other words, believe it or not, that same God who died for you, He's praying for you. He didn't leave you alone. He'll never leave you alone. He'll never forsake you. He'll never abandon you. He sent the very same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead to dwell within those of you who are followers of Christ. The Holy Spirit of God is here today with you and in you. In view of who God is and what He's done, when your heart is right before Him, sometimes you just have to creatively express your worship, your love, your praise for our God. You give Him honor. Because He's the only one who's worthy. So how do we do that? What does it look like? Well, hey, it's just in my opinion that we as a church, we have some room to grow. We do. And don't think I'm beating anybody up or criticizing. I'm, I'm with this church. But we've got potential to better express our love and adoration for the Creator and for our Savior. So let me give you some ways that maybe we can grow in our worship. How do we, uh, how do we express our worship to God? When our heart is right before Him, Sometimes we bow in reverence. We bow before him. The psalmist said, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. So every now and then, we just get overwhelmed with who he is and what he's done. Or you just fall to your knees can't even stand in his presence like Peter who once fell in repentance. Like the, the wise men who knelt bringing gifts and worshiping the Son of God. You can't even stand. So you just, boom, fall down and kneel. It's an act of submission and worship because of who he is. Sometimes we kneel in adoration. And the good news is, here's the good news, you can choose to do it now or you will do it later. Because Paul told the Philippian church that one day every knee, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord of all. I'm thinking of an old friend of mine. She used to attend this church but now she worships in heaven. I only knew Avis in her older years. And I've told you this story before about her, I think. I, I, I preached on bowing the knee in submission to Jesus. And Avis, her body was riddled with arthritis and she was bent over and walked with a cane. And I've never, I never once heard her complain about her aches and pains. But she came to me, this old, old woman, and with the smile of a child, she said, Pastor, I look forward to the day that I can bend my knee to Jesus. He's there now. And we can do that in view 
of who God is and what he's done, sometimes we bow in reverence. Here's one. We lift up hands in adoration to God. This isn't a weird thing. It's not a charismatic thing. Do you know what this is? This is a Bible thing. Paul said in the New Testament, lift up holy hands to God. David said this in the wilderness. He said, I will praise you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. Sometimes you're just overwhelmed and you just praise Him. So, what, what do lifted hands symbolize in our world, in our culture? Two things, and I don't want you to miss this. Lifted hands, sense it. Whenever you're in a difficult place, it's hands of surrender. My God, I give up. I can't do this. So sometimes we lift our hands and surrender to God. I recognize He's God. And I'm lost without him. I guess what I'm trying to say, God, is not my will, but yours be done. We lift up our hands and surrender. But when we also lift up our hands in our culture, what does it mean? The moment we lift them up, it's a moment of victory. Come on. Our team won. We celebrate the victory. It's an amazing thing. And the thing is, when you come, now check this out. Maybe you don't know this. But the moment you lift up holy hands, you get the same result. When you come before our God and you lift up holy hands, you get the same result at the same moment. At the moment you lift the surrender, you experience victory that you have in Jesus Christ. So we lift up holy hands to God. So how do we worship Him? Sometimes we kneel before him in reverence. Sometimes we lift up hands in adoration. Sometimes we just got to dance. What? Yeah. I remember the old church where people weren't afraid, ashamed, and the culture was, you know, let's spot the charismatic. It wasn't about that. My little church in Union Lake, Michigan, Pastor Fred Prince was there. And we used to have this old, old lady that sat behind us every, every week. Her name was Grandma Polk. And when the spirit moved on Grandma Polk, look out. She'd get her hanky out, and she'd worship God. Sometimes you just got to dance. Sometimes it just hits our whole body, and we can't stop. Scripture says, now Scripture is what we base this on. Scripture says, then let them praise his name with dancing. Now most of you, you've danced at some point. What? Oh, yes, you have. Yes, you have. You danced when you got your new iPhone or you got some new shoes, right? Or whatever. You danced when he gave you the ring. Woohoo! You might, may not be dancing now, but <laughs> back then. You danced when your team won. You chest bumped total strangers. You high five people you didn't even know. You're dancing in celebration. So every now and then, you just got to see the goodness of God. You can't contain it. David said that God turned my weeping into dancing. He turned my mourning into a moment of celebration. Now, I don't know who it is, but I know there's someone here. You've been forgiven so much by the grace of Jesus. He's turned your sin into a moment of praise. He's turned the lowest point of your moment in your life to a sense of his goodness. Sometimes you just have to let go and celebrate him and dance. Sometimes we bow in reverence. Sometimes we lift our hands in adoration. Sometimes we dance in celebration. Sometimes we offer a sacrifice of praise. The, reader, reader, the, the writer of Hebrews said, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually, all the time, everywhere, in all circumstances, continually offer God, to our God, a sacrifice of praise. In other words, we worship Him when we feel Him 
and we worship him when we don't. We worship him when I feel and see the blessings all around. And we worship him when we're hurting. We even choose. We choose even when we don't feel anything at all. You know, I've spoken to two of my friends this week, and I said, we can't base our faith on feeling. When you don't feel anything, you worship him with a sacrifice of praise. We sacrifice, meaning we choose to worship him. Because our worship is is not based on our circumstances. Our worship is based on his character. That's what someone will do here today. In the middle of your pain, in the middle of your heartache, you choose to worship him with a sacrifice of praise. Sometimes we worship him with a sacrifice of praise. But daily, daily, every single day, we lay down our lives as an act of worship. Guys, worship just isn't something we do. A worshiper is who we are because of who God is, really. The way that we live becomes an act of worship. Paul said this, he put it this way in Romans 12. He said, he said, therefore I urge you, urge you, do you get that? I urge you. This isn't just, I urge you to do this. No, no, no. Guys, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of what he is and what he has done, Here's what I want you to do. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. The way that you live, let that be worship. Do you get it? We don't come here to worship. We are worship. Offer your lives holy and pleasing to God. What is that? He says this is your true and proper worship. In view of who God is, in view of what he's done for you, Your only reasonable response is to offer a living sacrifice every day. I worship you. I worship you in the way that I live. In a job that I love. I worship you in a way that I live in a job I don't love. I worship you when I'm healthy. I worship you, Jesus Christ, when I'm battling cancer. I worship you when I have plenty. I worship you when I am in want. In the way that I live, everything I do, may it be for the glory of God because worship isn't just the songs I sing. Worship is the life I live. Worship, when you think about it. Worship isn't just the music out of my mouth. Worship is born out of my heart in the way that I live every single day. So, Could I get you? All across the worship center, could I get you? Just just stand to your feet, if you will. Just stand to your feet, if you will. Stand to your feet. Thank you. There you go. And I want to take a moment to get your heart ready. That's right. Get your body ready, too. Shake it out. Take a deep breath. Because I'm going to give you a chance to worship our God. When you first came, I didn't know if hearts were ready. I'm hoping by now they are. Who will you worship? Who is our God? He is our rock. He is our redeemer. He is our righteousness. Our God is our deliverer. He is our defense. He is our shield. He is our salvation. He is our strength. Who is he? He is the bread of life. He is the living water. He is the good shepherd. He is the true vine. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Who is Jesus? Who is this Jesus you worship? He is the light of the world. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Lion of Judah. My God is all-powerful. He is ever-present. He is all good through and through. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. Jesus is the soon returning, conquering king. And he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. So in view of who he is, we offer our lives as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. 
Because worship isn't the songs that we sing. Worship is the life that we live. Now, all across the church, any of you who would say, I am a follower of Christ, I am, and yet I want to be more intimate in my worship before God. Now that you've heard what you've heard, how many of you would agree with me with a lifted up hand? Anybody? I want more of him. I really do. And I think I'm not expressing my, I think I'm concerned with my neighbor. Holy hands before him. Father, I thank you for us, a church full of people who are growing and stretching. God, sometimes we, we kneel. Sometimes we lift up holy hands before you, God. Sometimes, maybe not yet, but sometimes maybe at home or in the closet we dance around. God, sometimes it's just sacrifice that we continue to praise you. But all the time, God, help us to worship you in the way that we live. God, make us worshipers in this church. And as the church and the world showing your love, stretch us, God. Please, prepare our hearts, God. May we never offer you again ever an empty gift of lip service. May our hearts be drawn to you. Draw our hearts to you, God. God, so that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. Stretch us, God. Be pleased with our worship, God. Be pleased with our worship. God, as you keep praying right now, every head bow, every back closed for just a moment. Everybody, if you wouldn't mind, just make a quick confession to God. Go ahead, do it. Talk to God. He knows what's on your heart anyway. All right. Now those of you, just look up here for a second. Look up here. There are those of you, you're going to realize, just like I did, I was in church singing the songs with my lips, but my heart was far from him. I didn't know him. I'll, don't misunderstand me. I believed in God, but I, I, I haven't had my heart changed by him. I didn't know him personally, who he is. So let me tell you about our God, if I could, just quick. He loved you so much that he sent his only son. Born of a virgin without sin. Perfect in every way. Jesus lived a perfect death and he died the most brutal death. And he did it for you. He did it for me. Jesus became sin on a cross. He died in our place for our sins. And on the third day after his death, God raised him from the dead. Jesus defeated death, hell, victory and grave. Because of who he is and because of what he's done. Anyone. Anyone, and that includes you or me, anyone who calls upon the name of Jesus, your sins will be forgiven and you'll be made completely new. He doesn't want our lip service, guys. He doesn't. He doesn't want us to be a hobby of our life. He doesn't want us to be a Sunday thing because mom and dad drags us. No, no, no. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. The greatest command is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Now some of you, you're going to realize he doesn't, he doesn't have your heart. And guess what? Today, he's going to get your heart. Let him get your heart. Now all across the worship center, uh, center everybody look at you. Look, those of you, and our eyes are open right now. We're just a small family church of love. We really are. How many of you would say I need his grace? Because mine's the first one up. I need his grace. Grace. Now, I have been this over and over again. I'm a believer in Him, but I'm living without Him. Any of you ever been there? Yeah. I turn from my sins and I turn towards Him. When you call on Him, He will hear your prayer. He will cast your sins away and you'll be brand new. Today, 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 give Him your heart. He is first. You are a worshiper. For those of you that know what I'm talking about, you say, I need his forgiveness. Say it. I need his forgiveness. Say, I need his grace. I need his grace. I turn from my sin. I turn from my sin. And I don't care who sees. I don't care who sees. Today I give him my heart. Let's lift our hands right now. This isn't a calisthenics thing. 
So come up right now. Oh my gosh, just listen. Look, look high. Look right. Look at this. Holy hands to God. This isn't a weird thing. Lift them right now all over the place. Look around. I surrender and I claim victory at the very same moment. Lift, my goodness, put them down, put them down. Okay, wonderful. All right. Do me a favor, just stay with me. I worship you. Church, some better, better give him praise. Give him praise and honor because we aren't praying for revival. Can you see it? He's here right now doing revival in the hearts of so many. We're right in the middle of it. Call on his name, guys, with heads bowed, eyes closed. Right now, would you pray? Would you pray? Even if you want to, just shout out your prayer. I really don't care. But let's just pray this. For those of you that, that are just kicking the tires on this thing and you're interested in having Jesus be your God, pray this out loud and we'll pray it with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, come on, say it with me. I give you my life. Pray it out loud. Forgive me of my sins. Make me brand new. Jesus, I surrender everything to you. Fill me with your spirit so I can follow you every day of my life. My life is not my own. I give it to you. And so I thank you for new life. You now have mine. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. Somebody just praise God. I don't care how you do it. I'm not asking for anything crazy. Just praise Him. Would you just honor Him? Celebrate Him today. Celebrate Him. Celebrate Him. Celebrate Him, church. Would you please? We're going somewhere. We are. Are your hearts ready? I mean, really, are your hearts ready? Are you ready to worship Him? So we're going to go into a, the presence of our God. We're going somewhere. We're going to offer a sacrifice of praise. We're going to lift up holy hands. Somebody just might dance, and we're not going to do anything about it. You might have to fall down before him. I don't care. But we're going somewhere. Let me read you some scripture as you prepare your hearts right now. The word says, Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise, honor, and majesty. Surround him. Strength and joy fill his dwelling. Give the Lord glory. He deserves, church. Bring your offerings. Come into his praise. Worship the Lord with his holy splendor. Church, tell the nations the Lord reigns. Let the sea and everything in it shout his praise. Give thanks to the Lord. Why? Because he is good. He is faithful. His love endures forever. Praise the God of Israel who gives and lives from everlasting to everlasting. And the people of God shouted. I'm not hearing any shouts. And all the people of God shouted. And all the people of God shouted as they praised the Lord. He lives and he reigns. And for this and alone, we proudly proclaim, and we do it boldly in Jesus' name, that we have, let's sing this, victory in Jesus. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him. And all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood atoning, and I repented of this. Let's sing the second verse. Here we go. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Sing it out. Oh. Sought me and loved me with his redeeming love. He loved me and I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory, and I heard about the streets of gold he 
on the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me and i knew him and all my love is due him he plunged me through victory beneath the cleansing blood oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me through victory beneath the cleansing blood. Church, our hope has a name. Come on, church, our hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. I just want you to really, really quick, this whole thing, it's not just where we're going although that's true this is what this is absolutely what you were created for nothing else so if you wonder like man why am i here why did god allow my heart beat today this is it this is it this is the sum of god's purpose for your life it is the breath in your lungs to give glory to the god who gave you that breath the beat in your heart this is it I am living for the audience of one. I am. the life that we live God in you oh man becomes irresistible to people who are far from him and so worship is not about to end don't let it end it's about to begin the moment you leave those doors because it's a lifestyle because we know it because we believe it whoever finds God amen See you next weekend. God bless you. Well, that concludes another edition of A Better Life. I'm so glad that you joined us today. Hey, if you or your family are ever in the Skowhegan area on a Sunday morning, we would more than love to have you join us here for a morning worship service. We're located in th at 31 East Madison Road in Skowhegan. Our website is nhccskowhegan.org. And our telephone number is 474-2957. Again, we'd love to see you. Our morning worship services take place at 10 a.m. on Sunday. So until next time, we'll see you for a better life. God bless you. Have a terrific week. Life has brought me to my knees. God of heaven, please believe.